Good evening, and welcome to the final event of the 20th annual, 20th annual Andrews University Music and Worship Conference. Can I hear an amen? There are not many events that go for so long, especially about worship and music. And so I'm so excited that we can culminate a powerful week. A year ago, we had a, an amazing conference called Healing Together as we came out of the pandemic and we questioned, well, what would we discuss next year? That conversation took place one week after Russia began attacking Ukraine. And we said, we need peace. And so we chose the theme, Blessed are the Peacemakers. We have had amazing worship experiences, profound, rich, in-depth, biblical, uh, scholarly papers on peacemaking. And so now we come to this final event, Black Venice Praise. You see... There's not a lot of peace in the world, not only a lack of peace in Europe now, but it seems every day I turn on the news and there is another shooting. And so yes, Black Ventus prays. One of our opening songs this weekend said the phrase, peace is fire. Peace is seeking justice in this world. Jesus said a lot about peacemaking. He also said that he came with a sword. Yes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We are all God's children, as the song says, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. So this is not just black Adventists tonight. This is all of us. Blessed are the peacemakers as we explore Adventist history, Adventist peacemaking. Praise, protest, and progress. There will not be peace if we do not protest injustice. So instead of telling just a Christian story tonight, we'll tell a, an Adventist story. I'm so excited. Welcome tonight. I also tell you, uh, unfortunately... Robert Hawkins will not be with us tonight due to some unforeseen circumstances, but Jordan Anderson has stepped in to perform the songs. Learning today, an outstanding musician, I'm so excited that she will be here. I trust that you will probably sit for a long time, so I invite you to stand and let us have a word of prayer to begin. God of peace, thank you for drawing us here by your spirit tonight. We ask that you would fill this place, be manifest among us. May we, we feel and experience your presence tonight and that we would give you adoration and all the praise. Lord, I pray that you would, by your grace, make us peacemakers. May we be inspired for justice and peace in our world and that we would commit to pursuing it. Bless the performers, bless the actors, and may we participate in that journey tonight. May we be present to you and your working, we pray. In Jesus' name. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Come on and stand with us like he invited you to. We're going to sing a couple of songs if that's okay with you guys. So this first song um, talks about how we're going to bless the Lord. 
with everything that is in us, right? The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And if you're breathing, which you're sitting here and you are, then that means that you should be praising the Lord. So again, I invite you to stand with us as we start.
good. Yeah? Okay. How many of you know that he's great? How many of you know that he can do what he did before, but maybe he doesn't want to because he wants to do greater? Have you ever thought about that? We always say, if he did it before, he can do it again. And that's true. But sometimes God doesn't want to do what he did before because he has greater in store. So don't get stuck on the last time he moved because you'll miss the next time he moves, right? We serve a God who can do it exceedingly abundantly above all we ask, think, or imagine. And if you believe that, then you won't get stuck watching and reminiscing on the good days when God moved that time. That's great, that's nice. But we get caught up and we miss him moving. And we say, I can't feel you, I can't see you. That's because you're not looking for the next and the new. You're looking for the last thing he did. So I challenge you to look for the new. Look for the greater. That's hard, I know, because you've never seen it before, but expect it, expect it, because the God we serve does exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine, right? So we're going to see about how he's an able God, and I want you to sing that with us, because I, I know we know it, okay? Can I just give it a little...
would like to introduce someone very special to the conference this year. We had a songwriting competition sponsored by the Adventist Peace Fellowship with a prize of $1,000 for the best composition. We had some great runners up that we still want to support in their ministry, but this check goes to Peter Flores of Andrews University. A real check, as you can see. And it's from Adventist Peace Fellowship and sponsored by the International Center for Worship and Music. Congratulations, Peter. As you'll experience, we, we, we've invited Peter to come not only to submit the song that we can promote through CCLI and through Adventist worship music and Advent Source as print music, but we want to promote Peter uh, by recording it here at the Howard. And you can help us by singing a song. So he's going to lead us in singing it. Nick Zork, uh, the founder of the Andrews University Music and Worship Conference is going to support and back up Peter in the song. Again, congratulations, Peter. Thank you so much for writing such a, a spirit-filled text and a singable song that we can worship with. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm happy to be here, and I have a request of you before we start singing the song if we could learn the chorus together how what do you say all right it's an easy chorus and all you have to do uh, at the beginning at least is repeat to me uh, repeat after me uh, following Nick's echo so we're just gonna do that first it goes like this blessed, blessed are heart of peace So that's the chorus, and then it repeats. All right, thank you.
makers. Sing along. Take a journey with us as we embark on a path of protest, praise, and progress. Our theme is Black Ventus Praise, fighting injustice, striving through protests, and achieving peace. Tonight, we will show just a few chapters of Black Adventist history that made the difference in the history of our church. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello. Oh. Well, hello there. You startled me. What's your name? I I'm William Miller. Oh, is that so? So you, you, you're the leader of the Millerites, huh? Oh, that's right. Oh, all right. Well, rumor me this, man. Listen, I've been an SDA practically all my life, you know? And we have different cultures, so we worship a little differently. But one thing I see in our church is division. You're the cause of that, aren't you? Oh, hold on a second. I, I, I hope you don't you don't think that I, I'm to blame for all of that? Of course. Well, well as, as Millerites and as early Adventists, we, we were known to be the church that always worshipped together. We, we had blacks and whites worshipping in the same congregation. And in fact, they even used to make cartoons to, to make fun of us for, wow. for doing that. That's crazy. Yeah, as a matter of fact, let's not forget that the, the first Seventh-day Adventist church in New Hampshire uh, actually had blacks and whites Stop the worshiping cab. together. What? And, and let's not forget about uh, Dr. Barr, the first SDA black minister. Mm. And also, he chaired the general conference in 1859. Wow. Oh, and, and there's a lot more. Wow, wow, wow. I, thank you for that, man. I, I really didn't know about all that stuff. Listen, let me holler at you real quick. Tell me more about these black stuff. I got you. Yeah, let me actually tell you something better yeah. about the return of the Lord when all of No, 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 no. Tell me about the black stuff, man. Come on. We, I want to know about my history. What's wrong with you? In many ways, the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were incredibly progressive. Not only was their tech theology radical and new, but the causes they championed were equally bold and fresh. Early Adventists like William Miller, Joseph Bates, and Joshua V. Himes all actively championed temperance and abolition at a time when neither of those causes was popular. In fact, 
Joseph Bates and Heman Gurney were the first Adventists to take the Advent message to the slaves in the South in the early 1840s, and they faced fierce opposition as a result. Abolition especially was a cause that was most dear to the heart of Millerites and early Sabbatarian Adventists. In the mid-1800s, slavery was rife in the southern states, but unheard of in the north. Slaves were treated worse than cattle, and their lives were pitiful and unimaginably hard. In an attempt to offer relief to slaves, a group of families banded together, pooling their resources and connections to create what was known as the Underground Railroad. It it is a network of safe houses and transportation that would move escaping slaves up north. Some of the most well-known figures associated with this cause were Harriet Tubman, and Sojourner Truth. Tubman helped thousands of slaves to escape via the Underground Railroad, and Truth spoke widely and passionately against slavery and champion abolition. In fact, Sojourner Truth moved to Battle Creek, Michigan in 1857 and was baptized as a Sabbatarian Adventist by Uriah Smith around that time. John Byington, the first general conference president and a farmer, lent his farm in New York State as a stop on the Underground Railroad. My face turned to the sun Weight on my shoulders A bullet in my gun Oh, I got eyes in the back of my head Just in case I have to run For my people While the clouds roll back And the stars fill the night That's when I'm gonna stand up Take my people with me Together we are going To a brand new home Far across the river Can you hear freedom calling Calling me to answer Gonna keep on can feel it in my bones. Early in the morning, before the sun begins to shine, we're gonna start moving. To Separating line. I'm 
salvation And I fight with the strength that I got until I die So I'm gonna stand up, take my people with me Together we are going to a brand new home Far across the I want to tell you a brief story about Charles M. Kinney. Some of you may know Mr. Kinney. At the tender age of 23, after hearing and attending a series of evangelistic meetings, this particular Tuesday night, he heard the voice of Ellen White as she talked about God's love. It touched Mr. Kenny so deep, he said, yes, this, this is my call. He joined the church, became the first black ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister, founded five churches, the first being there in his home at the time of Reno, Nevada. Mr. Kenny loved to do something that I feel sometimes gets lost in our pursuit for evangelism. He loved the person-to-person -person work. He believed that in order to win souls for Christ, I can't just give you a big meeting with a lot of lights. It must be life on life, person to person. So while he's not the minister who some say has won the most to Christ, the foundation he laid as a black minister is something that all the others has built upon. And his life echoes as he had such a passion for the Southern work when he saw injustice in the South. And he saw that they not only needed freedom, but they needed the freedom that could only be found in Jesus Christ. 
And so he petitioned the conference and started his work in the South. And his life echoed Micah 6, 8. Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Yeah, this is our call. We can't just talk about it. We gotta walk it out. Yeah. Seek justice. Yeah. I can't close my eyes. Standing up and speaking out. It's a part of life. It's a part of why we seek God's favor. Not just for me so we can benefit my neighbor. How can I savor the sweet taste of freedom? If my brother is in bondage, man, I gotta free him. From these physical, emotional, and the mental chains. Walk in love and never turn back in Jesus' name. Seek justice. Love mercy. Walk home. Walk humbly, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, walk humbly, love mercy, it's not often easy, especially a brother laying on the floor bleeding, instead of helping him a knee was placed on his neck, what happened to the oath you took to serve and protect, so many names, so many people that was never mentioned, lives lost, families hurting, when is the ending, God we see the evil, the mercy I don't see, now I hear your voice clear, it's supposed to come from me, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, walk humbly, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, walk humbly, yeah. seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, walk humbly, yeah. seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, walk humbly, yeah. Walking humble ain't the same as being super passive. It's a part to let Jesus come direct my actions. He was humble when he healed the sick and fed the people. He was also humble when he called out the evil. Pharisees drunk with power, Jesus got him sober. He saw his justice, so he went and flipped the tables over. If you a Christian, then the same righteous anger flows. Do your veins even if you got to stand alone. Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Love mercy, walk humbly, walk humbly, yeah. seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, walk yeah. humbly, yeah. seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly. I wanna walk hear y'all say humbly. seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly, walk humbly, yeah. seek justice, love mercy, come on, walk humbly. Walk humbly, seek justice, love mercy. Walk humbly, walk humbly, seek justice, love mercy. Walk humbly, walk humbly. Yeah, that's our call. We can't just talk about it, we gotta be about it. Let's get out of the four walls of the church and seek to love our neighbor. My name is Patience, I love y'all. Hello, everybody. Ours isn't any special engagement as per se, but we will be telling three stories, or two stories, I should say. Oakwood University story, and then our Oakwood story. OU? OU? You know? I guess y'all don't know this. As soon as slavery was abolished, the Adventist Church made inroads into the southern states and Edson White's Morning Star boat pioneered the work in many areas. In November 1896, the Oakwood Industrial School was established. Ellen White's writings, particularly the Southern work, brought about the school's establishment, as Ellen White wrote on the importance of vocational education and spiritual development of black Americans in the South. Named for the plentiful oak trees that peppered the campus, plenty of industrial work was offered for the students. Some of the original training included pre-nursing, masonry, teaching, theology, tailoring, farm work, and machinery. 
In 1931, African American students led public protests until the first black president, James L. Moran, was installed. James Moran provided a safe space for black voices and the further education of the students, transitioning Oakwood Junior College to become Oakwood College. And in 1962, Oakwood College was the only institution in Huntsville that would allow Dr. Martin Luther King Jr to speak on the fight for justice and civil rights. Black students moved the institution to speak and enact change through the civil rights era. Notable alumni of the school include the United States Senate, Chaplain Barry Black, evangelists E.E. E. Cleveland, C.D. Brooks, C.D. Ward, and musicians such as DeVito, Little Richard, Whitley Phipps, uh, musical acapella groups like Virtue, Committed, Take Six, and the North, the North American Division President, Charles Bradford. Oakwood is also famous for their world-renowned choir. Come on, somebody say amen. The Oakwood Aeolians. As of today, now Oakwood offers over 50 degrees in the School of Art and Sciences, Business and Information Systems, Education and Social Sciences, Nursing and Health Professions, and Theology. It is the only Seventh-day Adventist HBCU a historically black college or university. So my story of how I got to Oakwood is kind of precarious. I come from, well, I'm the first Oakwoodite of my family, but in my church, we have a lot of uh, Oakwoodites. So Debbie Air Snell, Bron Jacobs, Shea Crockett, just some mighty people in the field, but they were long gone before I got there. So when I'm growing up in uh, the state of Florida, in the capital of Florida, Tallahassee, come on somebody, everybody goes to FAMU. Everybody of my complexion goes to FAMU. It, it's a no-brainer. You graduate high school, you go to FAMU. And so that's what I was going to do. I had no thoughts of Oakwood on my mind. And so the summer of, or the spring of 2017, I'm planning on graduating and my dad brings up to me, says, well, have you considered Oakwood? Not the slightest thought. Who is Oakwood? Um, and so I'm considering all these cost factors because being a resident of Florida, I get bright futures, which means I go to FAMU for free. I had the GPA to make the grades. They also have the best band in the land, the Marching 100. And so I knew where I was going. And then my dad said the magic words. My money will be at Oakwood. And I said, oh, I guess I'm going to Oakwood then. Come on, someone. And so that's how my journey started at Oakwood, and I have never looked back. Because Oakwood offers an experience that only Oakwood can offer. Andrews University is diverse, but Oakwood University shows me a diversity that I didn't know existed. See, when you come to Oakwood, it's not just black and brown people. It's black and brown people that share your story from a slightly different lens, and it allows you to look at yourself introspectively in so many different ways. The fact that I could go to Oakwood and I could start a ministry called The Pride of Oakwood University, our drumline, it all stemmed from the experience that I had in Pathfinders. A lot of people experience Pathfinders in different ways and don't necessarily like it, but I enjoyed the drum aspect of Pathfinders. And so The Pride allowed that, to, allowed that part of my history to live on. The spiritual ministries on Oakwood's campus are profound. My goodness, the, the way that we can all come together and worship in various ways that still sound and look familiar, that's what AY was for me. And so many other aspects, the fact that they offer a dual degree program in engineering is what led me to Oakwood, but not only that, theology is what kept me at Oakwood. And so leaving Oakwood, I now have an understanding that I'm not just a kid from Tallahassee, Florida, but I'm a part of a much larger structure that looks and sounds a lot like me, but also doesn't, which is perfectly fine. And so I'm so glad that I was persuaded to go to Oakwood University because the journey may not have been easy, but it definitely was worthwhile. My story's a little bit different from Ryan's. Um, I grew up in Southern California. And for those of you who don't know, California has about a 6% African-American or black American population. 
And so I grew up not understanding necessarily my identity as a black American woman. And so I remember going to Oakwood and there's three things that stand out to me that helped me understand uh, myself when I was at Oakwood University. Um, one of the first things I remember was our senior day. And at the senior day, there is sort of the similar things that you've seen here today. There's dancing, there's music, there's shouting, there's yelling, there's crying, there's kneeling, there's prostrating. There's all kinds of different emotive expressions for worship. And to be honest, that scared me and made me uncomfortable just a little bit. You see, I'd grown up in a place with pipe organs more than Hammond's and maybe a smoke machine and a guitar if you really want to get fancy. And here I was with a culture that was so emotive and expressive with their worship. But as I was discovering, as I was engaging in this worship, I found something out about God that I did not realize before. I discovered God is not just a God of love, but God is a God of victory. That God doesn't just tend my wounds like a quiet father, but he's also loud when he sees injustice being done. And so I began to engage in the dancing and the singing and the praising and the prostrating and the shouting because I started to understand that God was so much bigger than what I first imagined him in my first context. The second thing that Oakwood University taught me was that I can be black and can be good. I think one of the things that stood out to me is growing up in California, I didn't understand who I was. I remember in second grade going to my dad and asking him why I didn't have straight hair like everybody else. And yet here I was with people with froze and braids and uh, curls just showcasing that they were good and they were black and that was okay. The third thing I learned about Oakwood University is the power of community. At Oakwood, um, African Americans, black Americans, we tend to be more communal than I think a lot of other people. And so through this community, I learned the power of communicating effectively. I learned the power of being held accountable and holding other people accountable. I learned the power of I'm sick at 2 a.m. and somebody's coming with soup at my front door. Oakwood taught me how much community matters and how it's not just my voice in a system, but it's so many other voices in a system empowering and enacting change. So we thank you so much for taking this time to be with us as we talk about the Oakwood story and our Oakwood story. May this remind you as you go forward and you hear this name again, how important it is to our Seventh-day Adventist system. Thank you. discouraged and why should the shadow Constant friend. 
and I know he watches over me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know This is Lucy Byard, and her story takes place back in September 1943. She was a longtime Adventist for 40 years in New York City. At this time, she is 60, has a liver cancer called carcinoma, and she has tried all types of treatment. The reality is that she has not gained progress in her recovery and proceeds to try the Washington Sanato Sanatorium in Tacoma Park. She hopes she can recover and be around her family. Lucy's pastor agreed to help her gain funds to travel to the sanatorium. Finally, she reached out to the sanatorium and they agreed to treat her. Here is her story. So we must love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. For Jesus reminds us in Matthew 5, 10 to 12, blessed are those who persecute are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. For it was the life of Christ who lived and died under persecution. Nonetheless, he asked the Father to forgive those who thought they were taking his life. But truly, he laid down his life down for his people and his oppressors. So, I say, forgive those who try to oppress you.
Now, Pastor, tell me, how is it that Jesus is able to forgive those who persecute him? You're right, Pastor. So God can be glorified. Oh dear, <laughs> if it wasn't for all of this excitement, then I would have perished on that train. Oh dear, it feels good to be among my people, my Adventist people. Oh, it's been a long day, dear. But look alive, somebody's coming. Good afternoon, nurse. My name is Lucy Bayard. Yes, Lucy Bayard of Jamaica, New York. I'm sorry, is there confusion going on? I don't understand. No, I don't understand. What do you, did you not receive the papers that the pastor sent on my behalf? I'm sorry, nurse, I, I'm confused. What are you saying? That you wanna see my husband? Right now, we just got here. Well, I wait here. Dear, what do you mean? What do you mean we have to leave? How is it illegal for me to be here? We're among our own kind here. We're Adventist. They're Adventist. There is no separation here, dear. I think you're confused. Hush, dear, the doctor's coming. Let's talk to him. Doctor, please kindly tell my husband that he is wrong in this case. You know, wives are always right. Uh, what do you, I'm sorry, what are you saying? Explain it to me, doctor. How is it illegal for me to be here? You have treated Negroes before. How am I any different from them? Doctor, how many different from you? Don't you have two eyes? Two ears? Are you blind, sir? Can you not see I'm Adventist just like you? Christian, just like you. Doctor, do you understand I have cancer? Do you not care? Did you not take an oath? Oh, I see. For some reason, you think Negroes won't be in heaven. Doctor, I know my healing is here, doctor. Why are you sentencing me to die here, doctor? Did not Christ die for my sins too? And cleanse my blood away and my sins away like he did yours? But I guess our Negro blood can't be cleansed. Don't trouble yourself. We'll go to Freedman. Dear, I don't know what type of healer that man was, for when I touched the hem of his garment, there was no power in him. Oh, Lord, Lord, give me a word from your good book to comfort my soul, Lord. Isaiah 43, 19, behold, 
I'm doing a new thing. See it spring up. Can't you perceive it? I see it, Lord. I see it. I hear them protesting, Lord, just to be treated like humans equal among our own kind. Help us, God. Help us and forgive those, our brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, who persecute us. Lord, you always use women to shake things up. Deborah had the same assignment. So did Ellen White, to challenge the system. Lord, prepare me, Lord, to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, Lord. I'll be a living sanctuary. Lucy Byard is Adventist. She went to an Adventist hospital and black tides and offerings funded the Washington Sanatorium. You're telling her that she's not welcomed here. When black Adventists heard about this, they said enough is enough and began protesting. What was sad is that she ended up dying a month later in Freedman Hospital. At this time, black Adventists started to protest. The protest of black Adventists wasn't ever about being separate, but they wanted integration. They didn't want separate conferences, but said that you need to accept us. We are your brothers and sisters in Christ. The Committee for the Advancement of Worldwide Work Among Colored Seven-Day Adventists was created to put an end to the racial injustice. According to the committee, the recommendation was to have full integration, lay out the injustice happening in the church, and to provide solutions. This group was originally against separate conferences, but they knew that something had to be done if leaders did not act. They feared that something catastrophic would happen. As a result, in April 1944, regional conferences were approved at the GC meeting. Yes, they rob I Sold I to the merchant ship Minutes after they took I From the bottomless pit My hands were made strong By the hand of the Almighty We fought in this generation Triumphantly, won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? 
is all I ever had. Redemption song. Redemption song. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them can stop the tide How long shall they kill our prophets While we stand aside and look Some say it's just a part of it We've got to fulfill the Ones you have to say Songs of freedom is all I ever heard. Redemption song, redemption song. In 1979, Bradford was elected to succeed Neil C. Wilson as president of the NAD. Wilson, who served as a vice president in the General Conference with responsibility for North America, moved on to become president of the General Conference. Bradford, the first African American to serve as NAD president and his administrative team were instrumental in the NAD's development toward functioning as a division territory of the Adventist church. Bradford joined the NAD after serving as associate secretary of the General Conference from 1970 to 1979. He served as NAD president until 1990. During a special interview with Bradford and his wife, Ethel, at this 20, 2017 NAD year-end meeting, Bradford, who started his ministry in the 1940s as a pastor, spoke passionately about the local church. He said, everything is contained 
in the small little egg of the local church. Love those people. Respect them. Know how to talk to them. Bradford added, don't think the early church was perfect. The church is made up of human individuals, but God is working with us.
Welcome to one of the best classes you will have in your seminary career. Who am I? I am Dr. Dr. Hyveth Williams. Where does my story begin? My story? Hmm. Recently, I had a sermon. I gave a sermon at the seminary. It was called Leading with a Limp. See, my limps come from abuse, abandonment, alcohol, and drugs. Ah, there was a time that they taught me that God is amazing. He's real. He saves. He restores. He protects. But at those times in my life, in going through my limps, I didn't believe that there was a God at all. So what did I do? I was like, mm, you ain't real. Let me go on to what is. I understood and I lived a good life. Fame, fortune, I had money. Lots of it. So what was the problem? Something inside turned. See, one thing you have to understand is that when God has a call on your life, he will not let you go. So it was time. It was time for obedience to take its place. Obedience, AKA doing my due diligence, doing my duty. It is the foundation of our life in Christ. We haven't even started to build a Christian life until we have settled on this point. I will be obedient. See, I did. God turned my life around. I got baptized. I entered into the church, but I still had those limps. I did. I went to Boston University, and I even tried to apply to the seminary. Can I tell you something? I was denied. They said, no. Uh-oh, you can't come in here. But guess what? You know, the funniest thing I found out is tell God your plans. What he's going to do? Pastor Samuels, he's going to say, ha, ha, ha. No, I got something better. So they denied me, right? But now I stand in front of you. I've gotten my doctorate of ministry, and I've gotten my doctorate of leadership, and I have a church called The Grace Place where today we are celebrating 10 years, and I have poured and poured and poured and poured back into my students. See, something you need to understand is, yes, was life hard? Yeah, but I'm gonna still lead with my limp. I still am going to stand strong with my limp. See, my limbs are things you can't see, you can't physically touch, but I see them, I feel them, I even hear them sometimes, but guess what? I'm still going to lead with the limp. Book after book, student after student, class after class, lecture after lecture, speaking engagement after speaking engagement and even defending my students with my colleagues. I am Dr. Dr. Hyveth Williams, the first Adventist black woman preacher in the North American division. I am the first. I will close with this. They did. We can talk about ordination and commission. Am I? No. They tried to offer the commission to me. And you know what I told them, Dr. Williams? I said, I'm nobody's side chick. If I am going to be ordained, then I'm going to be ordained. But you know what? From the place God took me with those limps 
My ordination stands in front of you. My path stands in front of you. I am Dr. Dr. Hyveth Williams. Thank you for coming to my class. the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He'll never, ever fall short of his word. I've got to fast and pray, stay in the narrow way. Keep my life clean every day. I want to go with him when he comes back. I've come too far and I'll never turn back. God is. God
before Charles Kinney became known as the father of black Adventism, before Edson White went to the South, there was drama in March 1891. There probably were black ordained ministers before him were, were starting to learn, but he still deserves this title of the father of black Adventism because of this moment. March 11, he comes before the brethren of the General Conference and he says, is there not just one white minister who would go to the South? Because of white racism, it was unsafe to minister to the colored people. Is there not one, one who would go? March 11, 1891, is there not one? And for 10 days, Brother Kinney, his plea seemed to fall on silent ears. The brethren do not discuss it. But on March 21, March 21, 10 days later, Ellen White takes the podium and delivers her monumental, momentous word, our duty to the colored people. That our Savior did not come for white people, but for all people. Our duty to the colored people. Friends, has she not said enough in general? Can we not just let there be a duty to the colored people? Oh, well, well, come on now. Can there not, can we just not say it's our duty to all people? Have we not said enough for all people that there is a word for some people tonight to hear that we have a duty to the colored people? Did we not see the contemporary images that we have a duty to the colored people? I think she might write the same word today. And if she framed it in the language of peace, that indeed red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Let us be peacemakers, for then we will be called the children of God. Let us be the children of God. Let us not be the persecutors that follow in Matthew 5.10. Indeed, we will face persecution, but may we pursue peace together. We have a duty to pursue peace together. What an amazing worship experience. There's one man I need to invite out here, and that is my friend Devante. Please give him a hand. Devante has masterfully put this program together, my brother. I have been receiving texts, how blessed people are. Thank you. Did you guys enjoy the show? Oh man, did you guys enjoy the show? Amen. We just want to thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Um, we couldn't capture everything, but I think what we did to do tonight is, oh, I hear myself nice and loud now. Come on, somebody. Um, and so we just want to thank you so much, and we just want to just Bring out the cast, and uh, when you see them, just you know, shout thank you, we love you, and just give them a clap as well. So starting out, you can cue it. Uh-huh. First, we have our praise team. Clap it up for Jordan Anderson. 
Ryan and Michael. Come on, and baby Grace. Come on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is family. Next up, we have the one and only Lucy Bayard. All right, clap it up, clap it up, clap it up. My gosh. Come on, come on, come on. Next up, we have our group. We have Elsie, Tashnir, and Devilar. Come on out, come on out, yes. Did they sing beautiful? Do your thing. And Carlos, yes. Come on, Carlos. Next up, she was doing her thing. She was signing, and my God, I was feeling Coming on up, Janelle Green. Come on, do your thing, do your thing. I mean, we are not finished yet. We have the one and only, the rapper, Patience. Here he comes. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on, my guy. Yeah. Feel it. Feel it. Next up, they come from one of the best universities in the world. From Oakwood, Oakwoodites, give it up for Ryan and Amalia. Next up, you didn't see her, but you definitely heard her. The preacher, the one and only, our narrator for the evening, Natalie! Come on! Next up, next up, we have... She played high with Williams. She even changed her hair to red. My gosh. Coming on up, Natasha Richard! Listen, our next guy, man, he sang this song so beautiful. Bless of the peace, peacemakers. We have Peter Flores and Nick Zor. All right, we're almost done here. Come on up. She was behind the scenes. She was killing it. My gosh, she was doing her thing. I couldn't have done it alone. Her name is Faluke Arthurton. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's go. And last but not least, they were helping me back there. Sound checks, they did an amazing job on their team. Brian and Juan. Come on. All right, all right. And so, we just want to thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. We're going to pray and close out, but all our participants, oh, there's a lot of you here. Man, they, you see that? You see how much they love me? But um, just take a final bow for everybody, final bow as we close out tonight. And um, we're going to pray and close out with Patience the Rapper. All right, should we bow our heads, Father? We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word, because he will never fail us. Father, tonight we were reminded, we were informed, we were inspired, we were encouraged, we were invigorated to continue to press forward. Because Father, we've come a long way, but there's still so far to go before we look like your bride. And Father, you're coming for a church without spot or wrinkle, so we got work to do. But Father, we can't do it alone. We gotta do it together. But we need your spirit. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need your understanding. We need your compassion. God, we need your boldness to complete the work. So, Father, go with us. Go before us and be on every side. Father, I thank you for every person on this stage that has lent their gift, their talents, their experience, their testimony. And I thank you for everyone who came out tonight not sure what to expect, Lord, but they came anyway, and I pray that they left with exactly what you intended for them to receive. 
So, Father, I pray that you will bless us as we depart from this place, but never from your presence. And, Father, I pray that we can do this again, but before the throne in heaven. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And so I did forget. And last but definitely not least, can you give it up for our beautiful band? Give it up, beautiful band. We got Nate and Nate. And yes, my guy, yes, yes. He's like, you're going to get it one day, all right? <laughs> um, okay. Um, so when you go out, T-shirts will be sold outside. Um, there will be some, some vendors as well. And so if you can, stop by. If not, we thank you so much for coming out. And thank you for this evening. Take care, everyone. <laughs>